Hello everyone, welcome to the third series um, of 30 Days of Activism from February 8th to um, March 8th, 2022, an initiative by the Elite Climate Action to see how we can spotlight women that are working on issues on women's rights and other related issues that affect women um, in our day to day and to see how far we have gone, what is needed, what are the state of women's rights in the world today. Because I believe that, um, that there's a need for the world to create a safe place for women and girls to be able to exercise their rights. And most importantly, I have um, Dara that is here today to speak more on what the threats that women's rights are faced with in our day to day, in the course of us trying to protect our environment. So you have the floor now. You can go quickly introduce yourself to our audience. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Daria and I am have a very great passion to cover the subject of human rights and the environment and how they're interrelated and how we can use these very good approach to protect our rights and today I would like to talk about mostly um, of the role of women in this uh, in this approach so uh, thank you again to our dear host to having me here because it's great pleasure it's a great opportunity to share knowledge because women uh, as I believe, are the one who is responsible of sharing knowledge, sharing expertise over different subjects. And thank you again uh, for this opportunity. Thank you so much for coming, for accepting this invitation. And I know you have a wealth of knowledge on this issue pertaining um, women's defenders, murderers, you know, the, the, the statistics, the studies, uh, different kind of research that have been conducted because recently that was last year I saw research from um, Guardian newspaper that brought a lot of articles about the threats that people have been faced with because I know that there are some countries that is very risky for them to for, for the protection of women's rights you know for people that are fighting for environmental protection and I think to a larger extent or to a, a certain extent that nobody should be threatened for trying to protect our environment because we are all trying to make it to be a safer place than it was. And it's all our joint efforts to see that we are able to benefit from a secured environment, not a threatened environment. We are seeing it through cyclone, floods, and the rest. So I really want to get your knowledge on what it means you know when women are being threatened with murder murderer or um or are being murdered due to the fact that they are trying to protect their environment what are the studies the statistics the research and all you think we need to know about the state of women's rights in our world today yeah uh, so, first of all, we need to know who are environmental human rights defenders. So, according to the definition done by United Nations, uh, environmental human rights defenders are individuals or groups of people who in their professional or personal uh, capacity in a peaceful manner try to uh, protect and promote human rights and uh, the environmental protection and over different resources it can be water air land soils and biodiversity so we know that climate crisis and environmental degradation affected so much the most vulnerable groups of people like women elderly children indigenous people so many and according to the statistics of aj atlas that's a special platform that gathers all data regarding the world's uh, co environmental conflicts according to them 21 percent of all cases uh, regarding environmental conflicts highlight the role of women 
into these uh, conflicts as a leader or claimant um, for the feminist mobilization, because these women usually are being disproportionately affected by environmental or health impact. And usually these women and many of them face repression and killings. So according to the special reporter on human rights and the environment, <clears throat> Mr. John Knox, he was saying that women environmental human rights defenders regularly face gender-based violence and exclusion from male-dominated decision-making process. So here we understand that the biggest issue for women is to participate in decision-making processes over environmental issues. So of course, we're here not only to talk about bad practices or tragic practices, let's say. <clears throat> I uh, couldn't find also a good uh, practices. Uh, first of all, in um, South Africa in 1998, the South African National Environmental Management Act established that the right of the public to be consulted before the environment uh, that can be harmed requires that women and other vulnerable uh, groups must be consulted and participate in decision making uh, about the environment. Another good practice can be found in the Philippines, where um, feminist participatory action research program of the Asian Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development uh, is empowering women to participate in policy debates over climate change. So we see that these practices exist in, in our world. Of course, it's not very well spread. So we need to do our best to make it more, uh, to make women involved, involved in um, uh, environmental protection contribute to, to this decision making. So, but now we of course need to talk a little bit about bad practices while women are suffering while protecting the environment. So first of all, we understand that origins of this, um, of this situation comes from the patriarchal uh, societies dominated in post pre-industrial and industrial periods when uh, gender roles were very um, strict to what women should do, what men should do, and any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of uh, shift from this pattern could easily be punished, especially for women. That's why for the long period of time, they were excluded from um, decision making uh, and they can be punished for them. So women, for women, it's much harder to uh, provide mobilization uh, because they need to balance between their reproductive and social, uh, social responsibilities. So, uh, and geographically speaking, of course, um, <clears throat> there are much more data about uh, environmental human rights defenders as women in Latin America and Southeastern Asia compared to, for example, the African countries. Uh, and of course, the data on women environmental defenders is not sufficient enough Currently, uh, there are just a couple of uh, scientific peer review researchers um, who is covering this issue. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there are not so many uh, statistics which can be used on this issue. Uh, then, of course, we need to uh, talk about certain countries where uh, people uh, get un unfortunately murdered for uh, protecting and respecting um, human rights uh, to healthy and sustained environment. <clears throat> this is a country mostly the one where there is no political tolerance towards uh, civil societies and uh, organizations whose 
uh, documenting attacks uh, and their abilities to speak out without brutal consequence. So, for example, the biggest country who is now challenging um, the safe way to protect the environment is such countries like Brazil, like Colombia, like the Philippines, um, Nicaragua, no, yes, Nicaragua, Honduras, and uh, Indonesia, for example. So, and uh, speaking of women, despite all circumstances, different countries, uh, the background of these women environmental human rights defenders, there is unfortunately a quite universal uh, pattern um, why these uh, terrible things happen to women. And uh, the biggest difficulties, of course, is that for example, uh, white women are not victims of system systemic uh, discriminations. And the women, the white women who got murdered in a country, in a continent like Africa and Latin America is usually the one who moved to these countries to, uh, and they use their privilege to speak for the vulnerable people to, or from, from this area. Um, so for example, we know the case of sister uh, Dorothy Stang, uh, the American uh, nun who moved to Brazil and they helped to protect the Amazon forest. We we'll also know the case, for example, of Diane Fossey, a professional um, scientist who uh, studied mountain gorillas in Rwanda. She also got uh, murdered for her actions. Uh, so now we know that also that people of color, indigenous people, unfortunately, um, and their murders is becoming normalized in context where in the countries where lives or, and threats uh, and where lives uh, is treated as disposable and where their contributions to environmental justice are not um, undervalued. So everything what they are doing is quite diminished, unfortunately. So also usually uh, like political uh, authorities, governments make us think that environmentalists who protected the environment is usually empowered um, the poor people. Uh, but usually what we see is that women who are protecting the environment usually middle or upper, upper class, uh, from the middle or upper class, they are very well educated women. And uh, because when you're very well educated, uh, you have a very environmental uh, oriented uh, conscious. You, you're willing to not only protect your life, but also the life who are, who are next to you, who are living next to you. Because in many cultures, women are the one who is responsible for younger generation, for the children, and for senior generations, for yeah. elderly. That's why women... Just yeah, to that's why women, in. Okay, just yeah. to cut in, um, to ask, you know, you have mentioned quite a number of things about women, in different countries, Amazon and the rest. So I'm really keen to know what could be the single greatest threat that women environmentalists, climate justice activists face or that makes them to be prone to murder or to be threatened because the climate change crisis is a life threatening issues that affect every areas. And so what could be those that singular factors? Could it be societal um, norms, cultural norms? You know, because I know different countries access on different risk factors. To so a certain extent, some countries, it can be risk, it might be more risky for you to be an environmentalist trying to protect our equal values and the rest. So what could be that single greatest threat? towards women's protection that makes them to be prone to be threatened or to be murdered? Yeah, I would say it's um, 
set of tragic uh, circumstances when uh, women is acting beyond her gender roles. So when women is active, when she's participating in decision making, when she's claiming, for example, information about environmental conditions, when she's communicating with uh, companies who's uh, involved in environmental degradation, when she's communicated with authorities, uh, and then she's getting serious circumstances for these actions. That's when terrible things happen, unfortunately. So in those countries where, of course, law enforcement, human rights uh, enforcement doesn't work, that's the countries where it's easy to uh, be harassed, assassinated, uh, humiliated, and other things. So as, as I believe the government is the one that should be respect uh, the, the one that needs to understand its obligations to respect, to fulfill, to promote human rights to a healthy environment. So in those countries where it doesn't exist, that's unfortunately that sad things happen. Yeah. So, so we can equate this that um, when um, that human rights is equal to women's rights, which is also equal to environmental rights. Because I believe in a country where human rights doesn't work, definitely there will be several environmental issues because those are the issues that will definitely affect um, human rights from working. Just like when there's no safe drinking water, there's no food, there's no water and the rest definitely is going to affect human rights. And where, where there's no human rights protected, definitely human rights becomes difficult to be achieved or to be attained. So I really agree with what you have just said. And just to uh, align with what you said, to ask you a question that are women's rights environmental rights? And what are the international laws from what you have knowledge on environmental law that backs it up to protect women's rights when they are being, when they are defending their environment. Yeah. So, uh, speaking of like international law practice, uh, the human rights practice, uh, you know, in context of um, hard law, <laughs> let's say. Uh, unfortunately, for now, we don't even have any um internationally provisions in, in in conventions you know treaties regarding that all countries all states should provide uh, healthy environment and so and so usually it's under national level so usually in constitutions in constitutional provisions there should be an article regarding that um it's state's obligation to to promote people uh, to promote uh, human rights to a safe healthy environment so uh, when we're talking about uh, international law usually courts and uh, advocates and jury appeals to already existing practices and uh, the definition of how you interpret those already existing human rights. For example, when we have a, a right to life, right, it also can be used uh, in some cases when, for example, your life under threat of some uh, environmental degradation, right? If, for example, there is a factory which is polluting a lot, contaminated contaminating water and so and so and it's already proven by uh, some technical devices and some uh, independent um, environmental impact assessment offices and when you have this proof it's much easier to appeal to right to life because in this case your life is threatened by environmental degradation something like this so we only hope that soon uh, these, uh, um, the system was developed enough 
and includes on international level or regional level, you know, there is a separate uh, regional human rights systems for Europe separately, for, for American countries, for African countries separately. So we'd only hope that on this level, uh, international community also will include uh, rights uh, regarding environment protection and women's rights protection, but it's it's up to come. Yeah, thank you so much. Just agree with what you just said. There's a need for us to expand our law to include environmental protection and everyone's equal rights protection because I know it's it's different. It happens in different countries where different people are faced with. Um, with their life have been threatened or are faced with murdering or being murdered due to the impact that they are trying to create for their society to see that we have a safe environment for all. And so this leads me to the next question. I'm trying because I saw that you mentioned something um, coming to um, our environment, um, environmental defenders have been faced with killings from different nations, like how the figure keeps going with different countries. So I want to know what are the studies, the research that have been carried out on this issue? I saw it with that of um, Guardian newspaper last day when they brought out a report, a study, comprehensive um, report on how people have been threatened or are killed in the course of trying to protect the environment, such as Amazon and the rest. So what, what studies, what research could back all of this hope to tell people that it is real, the need for us to be able to protect our environment and the need for us to also be kept safe. You know, We are all trying to make efforts to see that we keep the environment safer than it was. And we are trying to also protect it for the future generation. Yeah, so usually the biggest uh, source for all uh, um, that covers this topic is a global witness. It's a big NGO that covers all stories about environmental human rights defenders. Uh, then there is also AG Atlas, that's a very good database for for learning new or already existing ongoing environmental uh, environmental conflicts, uh, of course, I think the one of the main um, research paper that should be covered in our conversation today is also um, gender. It's, it's research actually from University of Barcelona, surprisingly for me. So it's called like gender geographies of violence uh, and covering the role of women in environmental protection uh, actions. And what I could find from this paper, and uh, I personally also uh, talk mostly to, you know, to environmental defenders from different countries, is that unfortunately for many countries, where this conflict is happening, the investigation of uh, women's murder is not finished. I don't know why, but usually it's a system, systematic practice then when unfortunately the guys who is responsible for those killings are not found, or there is another one who is getting jail but not the real killers. This is what we see. Uh, another important issue, what, um, which is similar to all cases where uh, women, human right, environmental human rights defenders are involved, is that these people are usually, these women are usually aligned with the larger network. This is what differs them from um, male environmental human rights defenders. Women are usually uh, creates uh, and like um, they create a movement, they create a network, they create a community around themselves, trying to involve many people. This is, for example, I saw in, uh, in the case 
happened in India quite three or four years ago in Tutukudi, it's a small community in, uh, in Tamil Nadu state of India where there is a big copper smelter plant and uh, the women were for the first who noticed that their child were born with cancer because of this plant. And the women were the first one who started to organize the protest against this factory and so and so. There was the women who uh, sat down next to the government office claiming for uh, meetings with the company's representatives, claiming to talk with the government officials and so on and so. So we see women are usually not act alone. And this is very important in uh, environmental movement because the problem of environmental degradation is not a problem for one warrior, right? It's a, it's, you need an army and women are the one who can create this army. And this is, I think, the most amazing thing about women in environmental uh, protection. Thank you so much. You know, there are different successes of movement that women have carried out and in, in environmental protection, which actually there was victory at last. And there, were different, there are different roles that women are playing in our society today. And just a way forward, what are the solutions to see how women can be protected uh, by trying to carry out the environmental activities, environmental uh, protection and the rest so that they don't get being threatened or being murdered? Because we are all trying to bring a solution on the table. We are trying to be innovative and bring ideas on the table. So what are the way forward? What are the solutions from different perspectives? Environmental law, the community, the country level, the local level and the rest. Because I think at different levels, there are different risks that people are faced with when they are trying to protect the environment. It could be from the community level, from the national level, due to lack of law and the rest. So what are the solutions in that aspect? Yeah, I think it's a very important question because we don't want to lose our warriors, let's say. So the biggest, the first step, I would say, you need to go publicly as possible uh, to, you, to talk with media, to have uh, open conversations with uh, other international, uh, inv other environmental defenders, um, participate maybe in uh, different uh, conferences, in different meetings, and try to act openly. Don't uh, put a wall between your activities and uh, the entire world. So the second step would say to use different measures to 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 uh, to protect the environment it can be not only protests right it can be uh, petitions they can be uh, i don't know like legal regulations so for example uh, asking for some office human rights office to help you to uh, to investigate the case uh, to maybe uh, uh, to help you to um, to make environmental impact assessment, why it's important, because environmental impact assessment is a very vital procedure for uh, conducting any um, infrastructure project. It's in a technical documentation, in, especially when this project is uh, sponsored by big uh, organizations like World Bank, um, I don't know, anything else, like big international groups, financial groups, they, um, this step is mandatory for them to see if there is a, um, they call it um, consent of involved group, like, right, like um, informed and prior consent from the people who is living in this area, who's get potentially get affected by the environmental degradation. So for them, this part is very important because once this, uh, this step is missed, financial groups can easily proceed and then you, you, you have a limited power to, um, to protect the environment. Uh, also, you can uh, go to courts. Don't worry, of course, we, we know many cases where uh, women um, 
enjoying their successfully enjoying and winning cases in courts uh, regarding the human rights and uh, human rights to environment so seriously it's um so th the biggest advice for me is i as i see this problem as i'm reading those such stories of women is just because they want to uh, act only you know locally not spreading the news about the situation so all you can do is work publicly work openly because you have nothing to hide and uh, this should be your i think your biggest uh, weapon against uh, environmental human rights violators Thank you so much for sharing this perspective. I know we could go on and on to discuss all of this at large, but I know the audience will find this very useful because we haven't seen it. It's becoming alarming as how um, environmental defenders have been affected, both male and female. But today, because of our tactical partisan, we are focusing more on women's defenders, women that are defending our environment. And I know women are very passionate people, so they want to express their form of participation or seeking for justice in different ways. But in that manner, we could also look at what works for different communities or countries. To a certain extent, to so some country, you can protest, you know, why some countries, they allow mass protests, you know. So what works for one country, it might not work for the other country. So knowing it, these similarities and differences, it really matters in trying to break, carry out our activism to become successful and not to be threatened in any form, because we don't want any women to be... Um, to be murdered or to be killed because that perspective you yeah, are trying to share that idea could just be eroded out. So thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate your time. We really love what you are doing, your activity, your figures, you know, your studies and sharing more light on what you do. You know, we really appreciate you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And may I uh, give you one, one of my favorite phrase from um, from one scientist, one researcher, his name is Abramovich. He uh, told in 1994, it's like my uh, year of when I was born. So it was like the previous century, but he already mentioned it. So knowledge is a form of power. Unless we improve documentation and understanding of women's contribution to environmental movements, women still continue to remain unrecognized. So I think it's like very good um, words for, for all women, um, environmental women movements. I really adore, I really, uh, adore to see how passionately women are becoming more and more every year about environmental degradation and how little it starts to see um, men's you know like oh my god these women what they understand and and everywhere in every year we see how these uh, men's phrases became little and little every um, every time, and it is a big pleasure. <laughs> it's a big pleasure. I hope that it will continue, it will spread, and we will see more and more uh, involved women into this uh, movement. It's important. Thank you again. Thank you again Thank for you. having me Thank here you. and <laughs> making, yes, letting me spread my ideas <laughs> and opinions on this issue. But yeah, and I think that is why this initiative is coming up, you know, instead of waiting for us to start celebrating that day, you know, we could actually do it 30 days, you know, activism, spotlighting all of this issue before then and after then to see how we can move further in carrying out our various activities. And I think most importantly, governments, um, there's a lot of work or um uh, or responsibility that rests on the government in every nation to see how they can accommodate, you know, their laws, policies, amendments to see how it can 
help environmental defenders, both male and female, for them to be able to carry out their activities in a safer environment so that no one will be affected by, um, by being threatened or murdered or killed. So I think there's a lot of things to be done in the world, you know, in carrying out our different activities. And I also want to appreciate you for joining this interview, uh, for sharing your perspective. And I know it's, many people will find it very useful in going forward in carrying out different activities that no one should be threatened or to be killed because it's trying to protect his or environment because it is, it's, it's going to be more impactful when our environment is safer for everyone in the future and the present. Thank you so much. Thank you.